Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of Choice and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program. Is it worth it? Weighing the benefits of research data management infrastructure for the library, which is sponsored by Figshare. This session is one in a series of sponsored webinars from Choice and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. All of the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. To adjust the size of the slides or video, you can use the divider in the middle of the screen to slide the sizes to your liking. Uh, we are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our speakers. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation, so please do type your questions into the Q&A module as they occur to you. You can also use the upvote feature to highlight questions that you like or would like to be addressed. Also, there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Last, please note that we are recording We are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. Uh, now I'd like to take a moment to just introduce today's speakers. Um, Amy Gay is the Assistant Head of Digital Initiatives at Binghamton University Libraries. Mark Hannell is the Founder and CEO of Figshare. And John Petters is the Assistant Director of Data Management and Curation Services at Virginia Tech. And with that, we are ready to get started. So I will hand it over to Mark. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Hannell, uh, as mentioned, founder and CEO of Figshare. Uh, I am the moderator today. So I will be fielding some questions for our uh, invited speakers in, a little later on. Um, so for those who are, are not aware, uh, Figshare is a research data repository. Um, and so I'm slightly biased as to my opinions on, on the research data infrastructure, but I also um, want to, to just set the scene for a few minutes and, and talk about uh, my own personal data journey and, and where, where I think we were fit in, in the space. So um, back in 2011, I was a researcher and I had lots of data that I didn't know where to publish. Um, the publishers couldn't help me out. My university, Imperial College at the time, didn't have a data repository and Zenodo didn't exist. Dryad was just getting started and I couldn't afford it. So it is a free platform where anyone can go along, upload their data, add some metadata, publish it and get a DOI. It's the uh, often thought of as path of least resistance or a catch-all, uh, as all generalist repositories are. It houses lots of heterogeneous types of content. Um, and I'm always trying to think of ways of while it's fantastic that this is an open service for everybody, how can we improve the quality and how can we uh, improve the, uh, the quality of the metadata specifically? So um, our sustainability model is that we, um, we build repositories for organizations. And I like to say internally at Figshare that we do the boring stuff. Um, there are lots of different flavors of repositories out there for lots of different types of content that universities are trying to uh, manage and disseminate. And so, our version of a repository is just very good at um, making sure that your data is indexed in the right places, making sure that we can integrate with different systems. And this idea of it just works, you know, uh, strong uptimes, uh, ISO certified, accessibility compliant, things like this. So this is where I'm coming into the space from. And I think it's very important um, that when we're talking about the area that we're walking in and the conversation that we're talking about today is, I think we're all aligned in this viewpoint that open research is uh, good for equity and transparency. It's definitely high on the agenda of Figshare. I think that uh, research data management practices that allow more data to go into the community are good for um, ex continuing that accessibility for everybody. So equity on that level. Um, you may have heard about reproducibility crises and the idea that we need to make the data available in order to build on top of the research that's gone before to help move uh, research further, faster. And it's also good for you know engagement with communities outside of academia. And I think that's an important one that's often forgotten. So I wanted to highlight that as a start point of 
Um, these good intentions are often thought of as obvious to a lot of people. If I have this conversation with my mom, she will tell you these things seem like no brainers. But you also have to remember that we're working within the academic system and, and that there is a lot of um, legacy incentive structures. And so just because things make sense, just because things are logical, doesn't mean that's how it works in the academic world. I also want to flag for our um, talk today that what we mean by research data management infrastructure can be a lot of things. Um, obviously, from my point of view, I think it's software, right? Because that's what I do. I build software. Um, but within the library, um, libraries do seem to be every university that we work with. We work directly with the library. Um, you know, hence our, our swag over the years has been God save librarians. Librarians are badass. And um there's other services that we need to fit in with, and there's other services that the library offers. And so when we talk about research data management infrastructure in this context today, we're also talking about the people, the hardware that maybe uh, the library may be responsible for. And if we're talking about research data management, you may have heard of this fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. That's something that, again, library communities tend to be the lead on research data. FAIR tends to be globally the acronym that people lean on when we're talking about what we're trying to do. And maybe if we don't agree on exactly what it means, all of the different characters, at least we can agree that we're all pushing in that direction. And so um, I pulled up this top image from, from slides I used to present a long time ago, which is, I think, very good for how a narrow viewpoint you can have from just being in uh, in one of those aspects. And I think libraries are obviously much larger and have to accommodate all of these different aspects. And so when we talk about findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, I always used to think that the most important role of people in the system was at a kind of curation level, right? This idea that um, we could, if you have good software that can is able to make your data fair. I, if you have good software, you can make your data fair, but you still need to curate the data and, and make sure the metadata is good. Then um, with um, machines alone, you can get findable and accessible, but the interoperable and reusable needs a bit more thought. Whereas with humans, you can get to this findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. And it's kind of in this bottom diagram of Someone submits a file, somebody within the library usually checks it, and then this data is made available. It's got strong metadata. It's uh, uh, complying with university uh, policies. It's complying with ethics statements and all of these things. It's complying with licenses. And this is a, this is a big thing to think about because we do something called the State of Open Data, um, which is a survey of researchers around the world. And we try and ascertain their viewpoints on what is motivating them to share research data. Are they sharing research data? How do they feel about the space? And so one of the questions we ask is uh, who researchers would be willing to receive support from to help in reviewing, curating, and preparing their data for public release. And this is always a bit of a, um, you know, on the one hand, it takes a village. On the other hand, they may not know that there's support from their library. Or like me, you may feel that the library doesn't deal with that. Grant, the, the fact that we're talking about the space of a decade here also makes you realize that the space has really come along in the last 10 years. But this is interesting that 38% of researchers um, said that they would rely upon their institution, research officers, peers, and librarians to help them with reviewing, curating, and preparing their data for public release. 41% relied on publishers. Uh, so it's it's while we're talking about this conversation, I think we'd be remiss to not uh, talk about the whole picture and be aware and flag that a lot of researchers are going to publishers as they see them as the place where you disseminate your content, right? Um, the other thing I wanted to touch about from the um, state of open data is if you look at these uh, longitude, it's the longest running longitudinal sur survey about um, researcher thoughts around academic data. And I showed this to somebody recently and they said, nothing seems to be changing. These, these, this visualization might not be fantastic, right? But, um, and that on its own is an interesting angle that when asked why you wouldn't share your research data, these are the responses. 
and concerns about misuse of data has actually in the last five years gone up. Um, not receiving appropriate credit, consistently strong. A lot of people want to get more credit. I think that's being addressed by funders. And then um, things like, I'm in, unsure about the copyright and data licensing. That is a question that has consistently been a problem. That is a concern that researchers have. And so who do they go to to solve this problem? And where are we going to add the uh, people power within, if they're going to the library for help, where are we going to find the people power within the library with um, all of the other things that have to be worked on to prioritize this within uh, a research institution? And I think that's a big question that I don't have an answer for. Um, and of course, I mentioned, you know, why, why has this in 10 years gone from, well, I'm not sure that researchers um, need to do this to this is every university around the world has to have it on their radar at some point. And this is last year, there was this dramatic headline from Nature saying the NIH issues a seismic mandate. And this was um, to share data publicly. This is now in effect as of January the 26th this year. Um, if you are funded by the NIH, when you publish your papers, you are required to publish your data too. Uh, they're not the only ones. This is a global phenomenon. Uh, if you look at the Sherpa Juliet website, 52 funders require data archiving, 34 encourage it. And this is really interesting, this bottom statement, again, from the State of Open Data 22. More than two thirds of respondents of the State of Open Data are supportive to some extent of a national mandate for making research data openly available. But this number is actually declining. And I think this is where the rubber hits the road when it comes to research data. I think it makes sense if you ask me, do I think it's good for academia? Sure. Oh, I have to do it myself? Well, I'm less, less keen then because I'm busy and I already have enough paperwork and I have to fill in metadata forms. So I think also good to be aware of the researchers, um, where they fit into this. So we at Figshare, which is part of digital science, are thinking about how can we try and automate some of these processes. We work with our sister organization, Repeta, who are looking at trust markers within the academic literature. And, and can we look at reproducibility from our papers having data availability statements, ethics approval, things like this. And I think with the dawn of AI, we can start thinking about where we can automate processes and where it definitely requires a human. And that is to say that the other side to this in funders having requirements is at some point there's going to be this compliance element to it. And using Repeta, we can see that based on funder requirements, how well are researchers at different institutions complying with said mandates? And I think this is really important to think about because, again, from my narrow perspective of, res of research software, I think it's fantastic that we're moving forward. Whereas different libraries have different staffing requirements, different priorities uh, uh, in, and have different um, aspects of this whole um, puzzle that they need to solve. And so I'm going to hand over now to uh, my colleagues from different libraries to tell you what's happening at their organization, starting with Amy. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Amy. I oversee the digital scholarship and scholarly communication services at Binghamton University Libraries, um, which is located in upstate New York. Um, and at Binghamton, uh, I'll be talking a little bit more. We are in the earlier stages of uh, getting a bit more of a workflow down for research data management practices. So for those who may be unfamiliar with Binghamton University, um, we are part of the SUNY system, which is short for State University of New York. As of the 2018-2019 school year, we became an R1 research institution. Um, so with that, we've been gearing up a lot more research and having more conversations about better ways to help people share their research data and other research output. Uh, we have seven different colleges and schools, which is a mix of STEM schools, humanity schools, um, and pharmacy, pharmacy, nursing, school of management. Um, and they're, with this R1 institution, we are going to be hiring more research faculty over the next five years. Um, so this is really geared up why at Binghamton, we've been having these conversations about research data management, and particularly in the libraries, 
um, with this shift to more open data management and sharing practices by funders, we're having more people come to us with questions, um, requesting consultations about where can they share not just their research publication, but talking more about the research data, um, the, the code that they may write for uh, working with different projects. And we're seeing an increase in consultations that come to us. Um, we've been working with our division of research to offer some different uh, workshops that are related to uh, data management planning and the DMP tool. Um, we offer, we do have an institutional repository, the Open Repository of Binghamton, which is the ORB, um, and we do try to help people with sharing their research there. Um, but this has become more than just a Binghamton discussion. This has become a SUNY-wide discussion for us as well. And over the last couple of years, we've seen some different uh, working groups, discussion groups, task forces across SUNY coming together to talk about what does it mean to have data repositories um, what's going on across SUNY is, should we have our own data repository? Um, how do we mon better monitor where people are sharing their work? And talk about uh, ways we can keep track of this a little better through research profiles. So some things we currently do um, through our libraries, uh, we offer uh, assistance with data management plan drafting. Um, so we have language people can use if they want to share research in our institutional repository. Um, but we also help people who are writing their data management plans through the DMP tool. Um, we have collaborated multiple times with the Division of, Division of Research to offer joint, uh, joint workshops. A lot of the times they're talking to more of our STEM researchers, whereas in the digital scholarship uh, area, we have been talking more to the digital humanities researchers. Um, so we're trying to find ways to reach both of these groups a little bit more between the people that we, we communicate with. Um, and we are also the group that manages the institutional repository. Going forward, um, since we are in the earlier stages of planning this out, when we're talking about infrastructure at Binghamton, we're starting out with trying to understand what is currently needed. Um, and a lot of that infrastructure comes to the people um, and what services are already available out there for people at the university. Um, so when it comes to the libraries, we see ourselves as what we always have with uh, information sharing, um, and that's where our expertise lies. You know, we can um, be the educators to help people understand how to work with their data for when they're beginning stages of their project and teach them best practices with how to make their data more accessible um, and share it more openly with the public. Um, we can also be creating different resources to educate people about different stages of the research process. Um, and, and I see us as guides to for other areas of campus. The libraries are typically a central hub for people um, at universities. So it's a place for us where if it's not something that we can help them with in the research process, we can point them to the other service area that can help them with it. So when would they go to the division of research or when would they want to reach out to the information technology services on campus? And also because we are the 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 people who like to share all the information, um, we are a great resource to help people with promoting the research output that they put out there, um, whether it be through our own communication channels, um, promoting it on our LibGuides, uh, promoting it through the repositories that we share, um, having research symposia where people can highlight the, the great things they've been doing throughout the year with their projects. Some of the benefits of libraries being involved with this that we see at Binghamton, um, it's a great way to be in the know of where people are sharing their research. Um, right now, we don't really have a way of tracking where people are sharing their data. So having a better knowledge of, you know, somebody may be sharing their publication in our institutional repository, which is great, but where's the data going? Where's the, the code going that they write for it? Um, having an understanding of where we can make a one-stop shop to find all of this. Um, and we we are information experts and we, we should own that um, and be confident in that and be able to help guide people given our expertise with knowing what information is out there um, and encourage people on how to how, how sharing the research data provides that more reliable information for others. Um, being able to build those relationships with the division of research has been very beneficial for us. Um, they they get to talk to people that we may not be, maybe not have reached uh, being a newer department in the libraries. Um, so that's been super helpful. And I'd like to build more of those relationships with them um, as they are also working with different PIs for grant projects and where the where we fall in the workflow for that and communicating with other services on campus like our ITS. 
Um, and just be more connected with research, not just at, at Binghamton, but also our other SUNY institutions, be able to help promote each other as we go forward. Um, and not all SUNY institutions are R1 institutions. So we do have uh, smaller institutions that could use a little bit more support from those of us who have a little bit more funding in that area. Some of the challenges um, that go along with the benefits, you know, current bandwidth of people involved, um, a lot of the times we're either people who are hearing that these needs are happening for our uh, faculty, our graduate students, um, but we can only do so much uh, given our current capabilities. Um, so being realistic about what the role is for us in the libraries. Um, you know, I see us as the educators. I see us as the, the, the help with outreach and, and the guides. Um, but I don't see us as the people who are um, forcing different mandates on people. Um, you know, there should be uh, other pieces of that infrastructure that helps with that guidance um, or the people who help encourage people on where else they can share. Um, the different needs that come about with, with research output, you know, uh, there's the, in the digital scholarship team, we've been lucky that we have people who know how to help people with data cleaning and data visualization and analysis. Um, and, you know, you know, there's also metadata experts in libraries um, that can help people with ways to explain and describe their data so that it is more discoverable. Um, but sometimes there's needs for different people in STEM fields versus management fields uh, versus health sciences and versus humanities. There's just so much different uh, research output that goes out there. Um, and just being overwhelmed by how much is changing. Uh, mandates are constantly changing and trying to keep up with that. There's always a new repository becoming available. Um, so how do we know which one is the best repository to send somebody to based on th their research output? Um, and just funding in general. Um, you know, I in a, in a dream world, I would love to just keep growing a team, but you know, that's not always something that can happen. Um, so where do where can we realistically help people? Um, and what is it that they need us to help them with? So going forward, um, as we build this, this people and service side of the infrastructure, um, I, I like our digital scholarship team being part of it in the libraries and pulling in our metadata experts more. Um, we have some, some colleagues in cataloging that have uh, wonderful met metadata expertise um, that we don't have. So getting a bit of more guidance on how can we best be uh, helping researchers with describing their data that they're putting out there. Um, and our subject librarians, you know, they're the subject matter expertise. They may already know where people are sharing their research data in their fields. Um, so coming together and figuring out how we can better support the different areas. Across the institution, um, continuing this, this building with division of research, I think is the, is the biggest component um, and pulling in our ITS, but also talking to our graduate school um, because we do have a lot of uh, PhD students and graduate students who are also getting that research output, um, who are part of bigger research projects. Um, we've been seeing a growing interest on the digital humanity side of people creating um, some type of digital component to go along with their print copy, um, whether it be data sets of some sort or visualizations, um, or even just exhibits, we're seeing a lot more of it come out as well. Um, and also our human resources are great people to be connected with as they can keep us updated as there's um, new faculty joining on to uh, our campus. How can we reach them when it comes to orientation or during their first year um, to get them more involved in the workflow process as we continue to build it? Um, and just continuing these relationships across SUNY. Um, you know, there's things happening at all the different institutions and there's expertise at different institutions that we may be lacking that we can tap our colleagues just to get some help with uh, going forward. So how do, can we keep this communication stream going? In the year ahead at Binghamton, as we're um, continuing building this me uh, more strongly, um, we'd like to do a campus environmental scan to just get a better idea of where researchers are currently sharing their data. I said earlier, you know, there isn't really um, a tracking component in place now. Um, so how could we help with that? Um, is it, you know, worth purchasing a data repository for people who don't have a place they're sharing? Um, or is it more beneficial for us to have some kind of data monitoring software um, that will help us understand where people are currently sharing um, more, and continue this collaboration with Digital Research and, you know, just having an understanding of when is it their role versus our role, along with the other service points on campus. Uh, we're working on some different learning materials and making things more openly available for people to reuse. Um, and we're hoping to start building research profiles 
um, with our faculty and graduate students so that they have a place that they can be sharing it all in one location, um, which can also maybe be our, uh, our end goal for being able to track that research uh, stronger um, and keep that collaboration going across the SUNYs. And with that, I will pass it to our colleague, John. Yes, hello. Hi, everybody. So uh, I'm John Petter is at Virginia Tech in Data Services, and uh, I'm the Assistant Director of Data Management and Curation Services within Data Services uh, and at Virginia Tech. So I didn't do what Amy did at the beginning. Virginia Tech is the land-grant institution of Virginia, the state of Virginia, Commonwealth of Virginia, and a very large R1 institution, 35,000 students and whatnot. So that kind of gives you a feel for the, the uh, environment I'm working in here. So talk to you about data services and uh, and 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 what we're doing in data services, uh, and what we already have been doing. We've our 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 our, uh, our group has uh, existed for several years now. So Virginia Tech Data Services. Here's our tagline on what we do at Virginia Tech. So services designed to boost the value and impact of research data created by researchers at Virginia Tech, and our expertise creates efficiencies for researchers across the research lifecycle. So you know, Mark mentioned about trying to make data fair. I'd say all of the things that all of our staff are doing in one form or another help make data fair and make data available for reuse. So let's dig into that a little bit more here. So uh, <clears throat> I like this particular research lifecycle diagram. It's got a low complexity, but it's kind of simple too. From our colleagues at Carnegie Mellon, so going from the design stage to the research planning stage, research data collection and analysis and iterative process publishing and archiving our outputs and making them available for reuse. And within data services, we do help with all of these different pieces. We help with data management planning for research proposals or for research projects, help people find data to help them uh, in the research design and planning process, development of metadata schema. Our metadata services group is, in, is within our data services group. We have informatics consultants. We have people who have uh, research backgrounds in several different disciplines who can help researchers in different areas, work on uh, data analysis techniques, workflow design, uh, cleaning of data, maybe mentioned visualization of data, graphics design, de de development of those kind of things. So that's within the data collection and analysis part of the research cycle. And at the end, we have a data curation services group, which I, I'm in the charge of, and we run a data repository for publishing research data and other outputs, code and, and, and other things. So we do, provide services through, through the whole of the life cycle. We have a very large staff. Our dean has been very good to us. So over the years, we have slowly accumulated folks. Uh, 15 is the number I came up with where I said, like, these are the people who really are doing research data support in one form or another. The number could be more or less of that. So that's what we, a little bit about our services. <clears throat> so then quickly focusing in on our data repository, since you know, Marquez will focus on, on data infrastructure in that form, but we also want to talk about services and people and, and all the other things. But for our data repository, it, it's to highly preserve and provide access to research data products of the Virginia Tech community and, and help disseminate them and make them useful in, uh, in support of our land grant mission. I have a global land grant mission here at Virginia Tech too. Uh, for since 2016, we started running a data repository in house. We were running it in house with in house uh, development and, and software applications assistance on a Sanvera platform. And in 2021, we actually moved to work with the Fixture Institutions platform. So instead of instead of uh, supporting it all wholly in house, we were we we're now contracting out some of that work, a lot of that work. Uh, it's worked very uh, worked very well for us. Happy to talk more about our data repository, of course. Uh, but it's a little bit about it to start. So uh, we have a very well, um, well resourced and large and well established uh, uh, service as data services and help a lot of, a lot of things. But still, we've only been doing this, you know, 10 years, 10 years is a long time in research, 10 years is a long time in scholarly communications, how much has changed. Uh, in libraries time, how long have libraries existed? This is very new, like brand new. And so outreach, super important, always important. Getting this comment about library, it's not just for books and journals anymore. I just had, I've been working in this field for 10 years and I just had this conversation again last week. Oh, I didn't know the libraries was doing all this stuff. Like, yes, the libraries does all this stuff. We have to keep on talking about these new services, newish services we are providing and do it over and over and over again. Or else uh, they'll go find other people to help them. We want, we want to help them in, institutionally. 
uh, and developing needs assessments is really important for doing these new services, understanding what the service, what the services, uh, how they should grow, uh, how they should develop, what they should do, what they should not do. Uh, last couple of years, we did a, right before COVID, we did a geospatial data survey. There's a link here. The little slides are made available um, to look at what the geospatial data needs were around the campus and and how we might want to grow and modify our services. And these are important yeah, either when you're starting a service, starting the services brand new, and and, to, and as we as we uh, evolve them and grow them. <clears throat> So another thing is about this choices of repository infrastructure. So this could be an institutional repository or data repository separate. We have two separate repositories here. Buying versus building, uh, an important question. You know, we, we have decided in the end to contract out to, to, to digital science and fixture for institutions for, for our, our choices and, and our, have a link to a presentation I did a couple of years ago about that. But uh, the main question here is what support will we have? And obviously, the libraries has to do a lot of things. It's already doing a lot of things. We decided in our in, in, in our situation, we were better off contracting out this work because our developers we had to support different applications already had too many projects to, to manage as it was. And adding another one was really challenging. So it was easier. We happened to have the funds at the time to make the choice to, to contract out by, by some of these services. But it's an important question. And I can also say that there are plenty of other, uh, some of our colleagues at other land-grant institutions and other R1 institutions are doing this all in-house and managing a data repository, and they're doing just fine. So this just depends on what's, what's best for you. But there's are these big options. The other thing I wanted to mention here on the barriers was about data, data preservation and credibility. So we're talking about developing new services. So in general, developing new services, we have to demonstrate to our user base, to, the, to, the, to, our, to our patrons, the faculty, the researchers, the graduate students, so we can help them and we can do a good job and be effective at it. Uh, and, and that's important. You know, If we don't do a good job, they'll, they'll stop coming back. They won't come back. Um, a particular part in this, I think it's really important about data repositories is file integrity, the integrity of the content that we are preserving. Researchers are coming to us to give us their data, give us their content. They are just assuming to themselves, well, the libraries has taken care of this now for me. So I really can't go back to those people a couple of years later and say, you know what? We lost your data. I'm sorry. That's not going to fly. My credibility is going to be shattered. So thinking about the preservation of the content and making sure that I, I, I'm keeping what I was given is, is really critical. So a little bit on future plans, a little bit on our future plans. So outreach around campus. Uh, so uh, we we have, I, I think we have fairly, fairly mature, mature services. We are helping, we did a data a data assessment, a, ser, a service assessment uh, uh, a couple, last year, and I'll put the link in the chat when I get done talking, um, published it in an uh, article. And we have a lot, of, a lot of people we're helping and we have more recur recurring customers and this is all good. And we are, curation services could take in more data sets. We have to keep talking about our services so people know we're here, we're available, and they have to be made aware of our services over and over again. That's that's never that's not going to end for a long time if it ever does. Um, coordination of campus research data services. I was really happy to hear uh, Amy talking about this. Other groups to work with. Uh, nobody, no one group on a campus like this or any university campus owns research data and owns the. You know, all the things around research data. So we all have to work together with research, the Office of Research, research compliance, the IT folks in departments, the IT folks centrally, a whole bunch of folks. And so we're working more on coordination of our, of our campus resources at, uh, services at this time. One thing I like to see within the libraries is uh, more digital collection coordination. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the actions we have to take around preservation and uh, some of access of content, stewardship of the content are the same for other digital collections we have. And so there's opportunities for eliminating redundancies and duplication. So something I like to see more. The reason there's a question mark here is because yeah, it's not something we're necessarily doing, but I like to see more of it happen. Um, digital projects proliferate and can create more. Mess. And it's not just within our library, right? It's not just within our, 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 our institution here at Virginia Tech. Uh, research data is a thing that exists globally. So coordinating with other institutions, we're, we're a member of the Data Curation Network, which I could talk a little bit more about if we have some time. Uh, coordinating with professional societies, uh, ACRL is an example, but there are many others around who are important around the research data uh, ecosystem internationally, nationally, regionally. And businesses, you know, there's commercial commercial interest in in scholar communication, and how can we best work with them as well? Uh, we're not going to solve research data and making research data an asset just individually. 
at our campus. And so we have to work with work with as many other people as possible to to you know, make the research scholarly communication uh, a system we'd all like to see uh, come to fruition. It's going to require a lot of help. I think that's all I had to say. So I'll stop there and we can start talking about other things. Thank you so much, John. And thank you, Amy, too. Um, I, the, thank you very much for the people who have started asking questions. We will get to those questions um, and uh, we have some time for discussion. So if you do have any more questions, please put them in the box. And if you have um, uh, if you like the look of one of those questions, you can also upvote them and it gives them a gives us a better chance of me asking that question first, uh, as I'm sure we will run out of time. Um, so that was a fantastic overview of all of the different things that are happening, what is happening with two different types of organizations and um, the different levels of support that can be offered. We'll get into how it's staffed and how it's sustained a little bit later. But just from a, a purely... Um, beneficial point of view john you mentioned we get repeat customers so i thought that was an interesting uh way to talk about uh researchers right um and what are the what do you think the benefits that your institution sees from how you currently manage your research data what are the downsides is it purely a uh we have to do this so this is this is something that's only going to grow, so we need to get on it now. Or are there other benefits that the institution sees? Maybe if we start with you, John, and then go to you, Laura. Yeah. Sorry, my colleague, Laura. <laughs> sure, sure. So, uh, yeah, well, I think there is there is an understanding at these institutions that, and I think Amy also talked about this, um, we don't necessarily have to steward all the content maybe in-house. We don't have to have everything here at Virginia Tech that's ever been generated ever, but we do want to know where it is. There is an interest in the institution that we do have some understanding of where it is. And um, one easy way to be able to answer that question is to have the stuff here. And then, you know, it stays in the library, it stays stays in some, some uh, campus storage. It's an easy way to understand what we have and what has been generated. There are other ways to do this, but that is one, one way to solve that problem. Um, one thing that's nice about managing this, like doing it in, in house and in the libraries is, uh, and I think I'll, Amy also mentioned this question, what's, what's a good repository for sharing people, somebody to share their data? Well, I know what I'm doing with respect to providing access to data. And I know what I'm doing with providing with preservation of data. I know what I'm doing and I think I'm doing an okay job. Okay. Uh, it's very hard to find these things out for other research repositories. Often it's very challenging to say like, this one looks like it might be good for that kind of data, for that disciplinary data, but is it gonna be sustained? Or these are very hard hard questions to answer. And it's not, there's been a lot of work being done on this particular problem and it hasn't, we haven't solved it yet. So I know what I'm doing and we can have more control over the research stuff uh, here within the libraries that way. So those are some of the advantages. The downsides, I mean, it's a lot of work. <laughs> resources are required to make these things happen it, it takes us a lot of time and effort and that means that there's something else that the libraries could be doing that it is probably not doing or not emphasizing and that's that's true uh so i'll, I'll stop there and let you yeah that makes what we can circle back to that point as well because i'm sure there's a lot of people who are watching this thinking you said 15 people john you've got you've got all the people in the world right um but yeah, maybe Amy, your thoughts on on um, what are the benefits of the institution sees and what are some of the downsides? Yeah, I mean, you know, John said a lot of the benefits too. Um, it's just the libraries are seen as that hub for information. So we tend to be the place people start at. Um, so the benefit there is, you know, knowing and having these relationships with the other service areas and being able to put people, point people in the right direction of who else to they could be talking to um, if it's not the libraries who are helping with that certain point. Um, the downsides too, you know, I'm, I'm a little different than John. I have three people, um, two of which are still fairly new. Um, and I'm, you know, I haven't been there a long time. I've been here for five years and I have one person who's been here for a year and one who's been here a week and a half. Um, so we're still a new and growing area in the libraries. Um, and so, you know, we also, while we get excited about all these things that we could be doing and helping people with, um, we also need to be remembering what's realistic for us as a team of three. Um, and you know, when is it, when is it our role, but also having those boundaries of we're here to help teach you how to do something. Um, but we're, we don't, we're not the people who are here to do all the steps of your research process for you. 
as well. Um, but we will help try to point you in the right direction of what resources to use um, and how to do it within, you know, whatever budget you have, or if there's something that's open source, people can use as well. Yeah, and just to follow on from that, I mean, you mentioned um, the term, I heard the term overwhelming in your talk, and um, this idea that there's there's lots of repositories, there's not lots of policies. Uh, how how does you how do you and your team even keep abreast of everything that's going on? It, it, John, uh, John, you mentioned ACRL. Do you, do you have to take time out of your day to try and keep on top of things as well? It's I think it's an important part of of because it's a rapidly changing ecosystem. It's important to spend some time to keep understand what the what new funder journal requirements are coming on coming around the pike. Uh, what is happening at other institutions that might be interesting, cool service models that are being developed at other institutions, other institutions are in different countries. There's interesting stuff going on there. Uh, yeah, it's an important part of the, of the work um, is, is keeping your head up at times and then it's sometimes down trying to figure out how to develop this new policy for this little small important task. But it's an important part of, of, of the work. There's a lot going on and we don't all, we don't need to figure out everything locally here. If somebody else can figure something out that I can just, you know, borrow and say thank you. I will be happy to do that. Give them credit. Yeah, <laughs> give them credit. Exactly. I don't know if you had any comments there as well, Amy. Yeah, I mean, just just thinking about the you know the overwhelming side of it. I do take time to learn what other people are uh, working on, and I also have um, you know I have I have great people who are in administration too who will send things my way too if there's needs assessment they found somewhere. Um, or workflows that may look good that people are doing elsewhere um, and seem to make sense for what we're doing. Um, but, uh, yeah, a lot of it is talking to people around campus for just our local needs. Um, but I like to explore what people are doing at other institutions, especially similar size institutions to us or similar team sizes um, and see how they've handled it um, being a smaller group. Okay, fantastic. I see, did, have seen a lot of uh, questions come in. I have more questions, but I think we'll have an attempt at trying, I see you answering some live as well. I'll have an attempt to at try and answer some, uh, group these together. Um, so um, there's a big talk, there's a few questions around staffing. Um, so there is how many staff are in Amy's area? I think you've mentioned that, but how many specialize in research data support? John, you mentioned that you get down to metadata schemas and, and specializations, but there's also, um, I think you may have answered this, are they all under you in the library? Um, but again, how many specialize in research data support? Um, when you've answered this, when you've described your teams, in my mind, they all work in research data support. Is that not true in some way, shape or form? Uh, so at Binghamton, with their three of us, uh, the other two people I have are digital scholarship librarians, and then I help with our scholar communication side. Um, so since, you know, this is new for us in the last two weeks to have three people, um, one thing I've been putting together is just uh, a chart of where we're responsible for different stages of the research process. Um, so the answer is we don't I wouldn't say we specialize specifically, um, but we are generalists in our expertise where we can do a lot of things fairly well. Um, so, you know, our digital scholarship librarians, they help people when it comes to uh, best practices of organizing their data. Um, we do workshops and they have consultations for showing people tools to clean their data, visualize and analyze their data. Um, and then I'm here from the scholarly communication side um, to help people with writing their data management plans in the DMP tool. Um, and where they can go to share their research output after. So help them find the data repositories, um, institutional repositories, software repositories, things like that. Fantastic. Any comments, John? Well, I, so, you know, in, within data services, there is a focus on research data for different people, but how are they providing the services and, and to what level of depth? And how at what level? Uh, that's that's a varies across people. Uh, most of the, many of the people who are working in data services are faculty members, so they can somewhat sometimes they can kind of do what they want to do, and some of that's more like collaborating on research projects. 
and then our long-term collaborations where they're you know just helping a couple of people at that kind of level and then other kinds of times we're helping people in a more advice and guidance kind of view you know finding the right tool to do the data cleaning as opposed to as opposed to taking here give me your data and i'll take i'll take 40 hours to clean your data for you generally we try not to do that more it's like let's show you how to do that thing so you can do it yourself and do it again in the future but um it it, it, it does vary um and i think that's an important aspect here you know like you, you can hey even with the number of people we have here doing that there's only so much we can do there's 10,000 faculty and graduate students at Virginia Tech so there's only so much we can do and I suppose yeah uh, so that was a, a direct that's the most overt question from Monique Oldfield is how much time is spent on uh cleaning data and how is this service launched and you mentioned in you know working as well with the data curation network and and I suppose it's that kind of teach a person person to fish model, but there's always you've got to teach them in the first place, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure Amy's got some some opinions on it. Too, but I, I I think generally we want to we want to show people how to do things as much as possible, and uh, in some cases, you know, there might be some cause to do the work for people, but we have to be very careful with that because you can only do that so many times, and what what. Uh, the question I always ask when we're talking about service development here is we, we're here to support the research and teaching at the institution. What's the best way for us to have the impact? And I don't think it's us being data cleaners for 10 people around campus. We can do better than that. There are educational uh, workshops on how to do these kind of things or software carpentries or you know, publishing data sets. But that's the always the thing you have to ask yourself is what's the best way to, for us to allocate our resources to, to improve, increase the impact of the research and help the researchers out. Yeah, and I'll just add on to what John's saying, um, you know, in the libraries, one thing I tell my team too is to um, be be confident in those boundaries of, you know, this is what we do and this is what we don't do. And that's okay because cleaning data, you know, how long is it going to take can really depend um, how far are they along in the research process before somebody says, oops, um, I really need to have somebody look at this data and it's really messy. Um, so it could really, it could take a while. Um, I've seen people who've had to take um, a year and a half's worth of data and it was uh, thousands of, of fields on their sheet and it all needed some, some cleanup work. Um, and it was going to take them a while to do it. And so, you know, uh, some people will struggle with the idea of when you're in the time constraints of a grant too, what can you go back and actually fix versus moving forward? Um, so if we can catch people when they're at the earlier stages of their research process and at least help educate them on what tools are out there and best practices with, with cleaning, um, that's where that's where my team looks to do it. Yeah, fantastic. And I, I you know, there's this whole, uh, you seem, you both seem to balance it very well in the, the, the fact that there is so much going on. And, you know, uh, we, we just build repositories. It's, and I find that complex enough, right? Let, let alone uh, all the different other things you do. Um, but speaking of the different things that you do, the, uh, you mentioned as well, Amy, uh, DMP tool, data management plans is another aspect of this and um, getting the researchers to think. I think data management plans are fantastic because they get the researchers to think about the data at the point at which they're starting their research. And particularly for early career researchers or people who are on a first grant, that just becomes the norm, right? I've got a data management plan. But we have a, a question from Nicole Weber. Uh, I'm at a medium-sized institution that's likely to get back to R2 status soon. There's a lot of concern about survey fatigue on campus. So needs assessments have been more difficult. Uh, what aspects of RDM services would you prioritize when just getting started? Maybe Amy first. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, when when just getting started, I mean, I'd even take it a step back of just communicating with the other service points that are on your campus and see what they're doing and what gaps you can fill and learn from there and have that be your starting point. Um, that was one thing I did when I started um, was a needs assessment on campus to figure figure out where the gaps were and what I could start with. And data management planning was a big one for our researchers. So that's where we started. That was what I was going to say. I don't think I have anything to add. If you're not going to do a survey, and I totally understand the concern about survey fatigue, I have it too. This is another good approach is to just talk to the other people who are involved in research data around campus. 
Is there anything on that you'd change if you went back? Would you say, we probably wouldn't have spent less time doing this and more time doing that, less time hand-holding and more time doing training or? A hard question to answer. I, have to give I, don't, want, I don't want you to judge your former self, actually. <laughs> you never know who's on the call and be like, I did a terrible job of that. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure it all happened as it was supposed to. Exactly. It all happened because both... <laughs> You both made the right decisions at the right time. Um, I am cognizant of uh, everybody's time on the call, and we're very grateful for you joining us here today. Um, I There are some more questions, but I wanted to make sure that we all have enough time uh, and a little break before our next meetings, because uh, an hour is a long time these days. Um, I just wanted to round up, and as I say, we will follow up with all of these questions um, ourselves and get you answers sent back to you if you have put your email addresses in. So I just wanted to finish up with where do you think this is going and what is it competing with internally at the library? Because as we mentioned, just in the research data management infrastructure space, there's DMP tool, there's training, there's, and then outside of that, you have open access compliance, you have everybody needs an ORCID. So this is a lot of information for researchers uh, who are trying to do the best they can and trying to keep up with all these policies and whilst doing their research. So um, at different stages, probably, you, you might have some ideas of, of where you think this is going and will support for this grow within your institution and within institutions globally or in North America. And um, do you think it's a case of it will get bigger in line with the library getting bigger writ large, or do you think it will get bigger and there will be things that are less important going into the new world um, going forward? So perhaps on this one, John, to put you on the spot, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, so so I have to first I have to start with I, I'm you know making the choices about how the library allocates its resources is above my pay grade. But uh, what I do know has has happened as we've gone to allocating more resources and, and personnel spaces, or right, there's a limited a finite number of personnel spaces to data services. The 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 group there have been shrinkages in other more traditional librarian uh, library um, resource uh, uh, groups around around our uh, libraries. So our collections and technical services group has has slowly uh, decreased in size. Uh, we are. We have been moving slowly away from a liaison model of librarianship, although we still have liaisons who help with collections development in different for different um, disciplines. There's less there's less time devoted to that work as a whole is is where where it's going going as opposed to doing a department focused department focused uh, uh, um, services. It's more of what can we provide campus wide to all colleges to all the departments that can be of some use across the across the institution doesn't mean it's being used like our data services aren't necessarily used equally across the across the colleges but there's been a there's been kind of a move in our group in our libraries to to those kind of services educational educational support and research support um so that's what what's been happening um it's hard to know if this is like where what is this where is this going to go and where is this going to get us but it certainly does it certainly does afford an opportunity for us to support the the changing scholarly communications ecosystem ecosystem and the, the, that this that's coming from the funders coming from the journals and coming from the researchers themselves and we're going to be better positioned to help out with that i think yeah hit from all sides just as amy was getting hit from left field by a cat i'm always happy when a cat makes an appearance uh i don't know if you have any comments or uh Final thoughts on this, Amy? Yeah, it can't be a library webinar without a cat making an appearance. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, just to add on to it, you know, things are always changing in these areas. Um, and that's where, you know, I say that the overwhelming thing can happen. Um, but just knowing what's needed at your institution and even those changes can happen uh, somewhat rapidly sometimes. Um, and just being being okay with moving with the change. Um, I do only see this growing. Um, before I came to Binghamton, I was at uh, the Food and Drug Administration on a fellowship where I was helping them with data management planning um, and sharing their data as the you know mandates were going out that they had to share it uh, sooner too. And now I'm seeing the same thing happening uh, in academia. Um, so it's only going to keep growing um, and we're going to have more and more research output as we continue hiring researchers. Um, so I think 
you know, the important thing right now in the earlier stages is establishing those workflows and knowing who supports what, where, and when it's the library's role, um, I think will be beneficial to help us have a strong, sustainable uh, future with making this more realistic. Fantastic. And yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, I like to think of it as the, the arc of the ball. We know where we're headed uh, and who better to be dealing with it than librarians. Um, both um, Amy and John have put their email addresses in if uh, you would like to follow up with them directly. Uh, the, I, I, I just want to thank one more time um, John and Amy for joining us, John Petters and Amy Gay. I think you'll all appreciate the hundreds who've joined us online that uh, they really are experts in the in the field and they very much have a lot of uh, time to give so they're being very generous with their time. So thank you once more for joining us and thank you to everybody for your questions. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mark. You. I'll just I'll just echo you all and say thanks so much to Amy, Mark and John for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, and thank you to our attendees for your engagement with your questions and comments. Um, I'd, like to remind, I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording. Uh, also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, we would really appreciate it. So thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. Um, we hope you learn something new from the session and hope to see you again, hope to see you again in the near future on another webinar. <laughs>